So welcome everybody to the November Stronger Together Get Together. It's really good to see everybody. You're all looking well and it's nice to see a bit of sunshine sort of like bouncing off of us, isn't it? After the last few, I don't know, it seems like it's been raining for a long time. I know we need the water, but it's so nice to see the sunshine today. So welcome everybody to the 26th Stronger Together Get Together and the 32nd event that we've ever run. How amazing is that? And I'm actually de absolutely delighted to be joined today by Sarah Sangster. And Sarah has been on this journey from the very start. Sarah has been an expert talking about digital marketing and helping hundreds, if not thousands of business owners um, through Strong Together and through her own work for the last two and a half years. And of course, before, before there was life before COVID, let's face it. <laughs> so I'm absolutely delighted that she's here. And for those of you who don't know Sarah, well, actually the introduction, is short and sweet and it's probably one of the shortest introductions I ever do with anybody because it's quite simple. What Sarah doesn't know about digital marketing isn't worth knowing, okay, it is that, that simple and um, I messaged Sarah this morning saying is there any particular introduction that you'd like me to give and she didn't reply and I thought well actually it does what it says <laughs> in the tin. <laughs> what she doesn't know isn't worth knowing. So I'm very excited this morning to find out some digital marketing hacks that are gonna help us future-proof our business. And I'd just like to say a particularly personal thank you to Sarah for being here today. Um, Sarah, as many of you know, is on her own personal journey at the moment with um, with cancer. And she was unable to join us a couple of months ago because of a major operation that she had. She is here today. And I know that she's even popping off this afternoon to hospital to have some more chemo. So I think that deserves a particular round of applause from everybody. So we're very, very grateful for you being here. And we are very excited now to learn from your fabulous wisdom as to what's going on. What's going on in the digital marketing space? Over to you, Sarah. Yeah, thanks for such a lovely introduction. And, you know, I am sorry I couldn't be here for the last time. They made me stay in hospital, which I was most dissatisfied about. So, yeah, I'm not a lover of being in hospital. So, and some of you, you know, quite a few of you have seen me before. I've got, I'm styling a new haircut or a new regrowth from when I lost my hair. So yeah, might look different, but I'm still the same person. And um, and the key thing about whenever anyone works with me or I come onto any of these webinars is the more questions that you ask, the more you'll get out of me. Because like Julie said, I've been in this space for a really, really long time. So I'm today, which will be a bit more of an open discussion, but this is literally just the like, you know, scraping the ice. So if there is something that I haven't covered that you want covered, you can just drop Julie an email and I will cover it as best I can. Um, but after each section that we're going to be talking about, we will be opening it up for questions because there will be questions that will come up that you're just going to want to answer. So please, you know, no question is silly there's a few people in the audience that work with me on a regular basis and I never will ever make you feel silly about asking a silly question because no question is silly and I really do mean that so today we're going to be covering five things and these are the five things I'm seeing that people are getting the biggest results from currently and that are things that you absolutely must do when it comes to digital marketing and a couple of them might surprise you and a couple of them might think well yeah I know I need to do that but I don't do that so we'll kick it off and I'll hopefully we'll be able to share my screen and let me know if you can see my screen yep thumbs up perfect perfect so they're not flashy sides they're just little prompts for you to see as I'm talking okay so the first one is the most important thing when you do anything any marketing and that is getting clarity on your numbers now if you don't know how much you need to sell you won't know how much you need to market and it is really as like straightforward as that if you have if you're looking to turn over a million pounds a year and you have a marketing strategy that is going to hit a hundred thousand you are never ever going to hit your target the same as if you are exhausting yourself by trying to hit a million pound turnover and actually you only need 250,000, you are going to be chasing your tail continually and you just need to be really realistic about what you need. And so 
the exercise is is that you work out what you need to make in your year so say for instance if you're looking at two, 2023 targets now um then you need to really look at what you need to take across the year um work that backwards to actually how many people does that how many clients is that what's my cost of product etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know all of your numbers and once you know that you know how many things you need to sell and I have never ever done a clarity on numbers exercise with anybody ever in the 25 years I've been doing sales to marketing and people go oh I can't do that they go is that all is that all and actually that's the reality for most people is that they they think it's this ginormous thing but actually when you bring it down and you put it down on paper and you say what do i need to make what's my what's the pros uh, the what's what am i charging people how many clients do i need to sell that product to make that number and then once you know that you can then work out how many sales calls you need to make what your conversion rates are how many people you need to get in front of how many people you need on your email list it's really 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 super important and quite straightforward to get really clear on your numbers okay has anybody got any questions about numbers or any conversion rates or anything like that anybody unclear about or haven't yet don't have to put your hand up if you don't want to but haven't got clarity on on 23 figures and targets yet okay a few people that's fine so the one of the things you should really be doing now is making sure that you know what 23 looks like that you are building your marketing plan to reach those targets now what do you need to do to finish the year off this year off on a high and what how are you going to be moving into 23 in such a way that you're going to be going like i know what my target is i know what i need to do i know how i'm going to do it julia I just wondered actually if there are any sort of um, industry standard conversion rates for um, something like, you know, a, a number of opens on a newsletter or an email um, campaign, that type of thing. I mean, I know the other types of conversion rates are going to be very specific to your business, um, but I wondered if there was anything around um, open rates or click rates for, for emails. Yeah, it's a funny one because it really does depend on how warm and how clean your data is now we all know that i you know that lots of people have large numbers on their database or some people don't have very many at all but what you need to make sure is that all the data that you do have one is clean and if they're unresponsive don't have them on your database because you're literally going to just ruin your conversion rates and they're not going to be they're not going to be correct so say, for instance, if, you, if you're sending out regular emails and you've got a huge amount of people that are just not opening up your emails for whatever reason, um, if they're not bouncing, so that's fine. We know that some, uh, you know, especially with Microsoft Outlook at the moment, you can um, view your email without opening it. So there are some issues there. But if you go through a period of having somebody on your email list that for a year has not clicked through on anything that hasn't showed that they've opened the email and you haven't had any interaction with them you know whatsoever I would send them a you know do you still want to be on my email list or shall I remove you from my email list because I don't know you're not opening anything you're not clicking through like I don't want to keep bothering you type thing and actually having that as a, you know as an ongoing process because I'd much prefer to have a hundred engaged people on my database than a thousand people that never do anything one if you're on a system where you're paying for contacts or you're paying for email sends that becomes a very costly exercise especially when you start to ramp things up and you do things like lead magnets and you're increasing your email list all of a sudden if you're having to go up to the next like tier of your email sends that's a costly exercise so 
good regular housekeeping of the stuff is really good. So open rates, you're looking at about 20% on a not very warm open rate email. Click through rates, you're looking at anything between four and 7%. So, you know, but then if you've got a really warm, open, if you've got a really warm database, I would expect an open rate of 80% and a click through rate of, you know, 25%. So it really is looking at what you've got and actually saying, I'm sending out this email, what do I want it to do? Am I being really clear about what I want the next step to happen? And if people aren't clicking through, what am I missing? Is it too long? Is my is my um, call to action high enough in the email? Am I being too wordy? And actually analyze stuff on a regular basis and see how you can squeeze those conversion rates. Because when you do your numbers, when you know what you've got to do and you know all it, within your funnel, you know, well, I'm going to capture them here and I'm going to email them here. And then there's going to be an email sequence. And when you can actually go through and say, right, I've captured 10 new ones this month. Two of those click through to something. One of them's gone to a call. When you look at that every three months and say, right, let's look at my metrics. Let's see what's working. What can I turn things up? What do I need to remove? It's a case of being really clear about that stuff. And so when you know the numbers, you know when to ramp things up, you know when to slow things down, you know how long it takes to onboard a new customer. Um, that is equally as important because if you've suddenly got a really like low time, you think, oh, March is going to be really quiet for me. So and I've got a 60 day conversion process. You really need to start thinking about bringing those people on in January. Otherwise, you're not going to be busy in March. So it's really, really understanding your numbers is so, so, so important. Okay. Right. The next one we're going to talk about is uh, repurposing. Now, you may hear lots of people talk about repurposing. Um, but what I want you to do is start thinking about working really smart when it comes to repurposing. Ultimately, what you do as a business is what you do. And marketeers like me, although I don't do this, but other marketeers do, will tell you, you've got to be everywhere. You've got to be visible. You've got to be on every platform. You've got to, got to, got to get out there and do it. And when you look at your week, you think, when am I actually going to service these clients? When am I actually going to do the things? When am I going to have a life? And so it's very sort of, it's not helpful for marketeers to tell you sometimes how to market your business because they're looking at it only from a marketing point of view, okay? So when you look at what you do, you look at your billable hours, you look at when you're going to create passive revenue, all those sorts of things. I do a really nice exercise around billable hours and the perfect year. And when you work out actually how much time do I have left for marketing, for self-education, all of those sorts of things, you then need to think, I've got so much time for marketing, what am I going to do? And the easiest way to do it is to work smart. And so this is my content pyramid. You may have seen this before. You may not have seen this before. But the easiest way to create content for yourself, and I'm not talking about outsourcing to anybody else, but making content for yourself, is to create content in a way that you can repurpose it as many times as possible. And that is creating videos. OK, so if you create a video, You've got the actual video itself that you can put onto YouTube, you can put onto your own platform, you can put into uh, Facebook, you can um, slice it down and pop it onto IGTV, all of these sorts of things. But you have an original video of you talking to camera. OK, you can take stills from that. So you've got actual um, imagery that you can take and then overlay. So if you think, oh, I can't really afford to have somebody take a whole load of pictures of me actually talking to camera. And being able to take video, uh, sorry, imagery stills is really important too. You can strip out the audio and turn it into an MP3, um, and then, like you see, the next la the next level down, you can turn this into things like podcasts. You can have those transcribed using software like Otter, um, or um, there's a couple others, but they're slipping my mind. I use Otter, so that's the one I always talk about. Um, you can have them transcribed. And you can have those tidied up and turned into blogs and then you can turn it into a graphic based post. So imagery with a short form text. OK, so that's the that's the smartest way to work. 
but we're not always in the in a smart space to work so sometimes we have to go actually I can't do that but uh, and I'm no good at writing but I'm really good at talking about what I do so therefore you can take one step down and go to audio so you can create a podcast that you can have transcribed turned into a uh, graphic uh, graphic post as I've said and then next layer down blog and then graphic post but where possible you want to gonna you want to be creating really smart content where you can actually either say to somebody I've created this video I now want you to strip this down and you know pull out the audio pull out the uh, turn it into a blog turn it into a graphic post and pop this information out there now when you think about all these places you can put stuff when you create content once for it to be pushed out to multiple platforms, you, you have the appearance of being everywhere, having high visibility, but with only having to do the work once. Now, on Facebook, there are so many different types of posts you can do. There's videos, there's obviously graphic posts. You can do um, slider posts where you're doing, they are video based, but they're graphic driven. So they are like a slide. Um, on um, Instagram, you can do stories, you can do reels, you can do your IGTV, you can do your grid posts. On Twitter, obviously, you can do your image posts, you can do your video posts, you can do your GIF posts, you can push it out to things like TikTok, you can then push it out to LinkedIn. So you don't have to be everywhere, but you do have to make sure that you're showing up in the right places that whenever people are looking for you or whenever people are in the area of thinking, I really need this service, that you are always front of mind. So do you have your socials covered? Do you have your email covered? Are you making sure, <coughs> excuse me, when people come to your website, they've been able to see the most up-to-date content from you? And using the content pyramid is a really nice way of creating content without feeling like you are just constantly creating content and not knowing where that's going to come from. OK, any questions about that? There was one from um, Denise asking if um, you have any recommendations for a particular type of software to actually uh, for video. Um, and um, Emma has said that she uses Zoom, which is actually what I do as well, record myself. And um, Fiona has said that she uses her phone or Zoom or and um, video cutter expert for videos. Um, okay. So do you have any other ones, any yeah, other recommendations? So recording myself, I really like to use Loom. Um, if any those who use that use Loom, so it has a circle image of me in the corner, so people can see me as I'm talking, and then I can share my screen, and I can flip between myself and the screen. So that's a really nice way to use. Really, uh, you, there is a free version, but if you do need to go to the paid version, it's really inexpensive. If you are phones, obviously are brilliant, especially now these days with iPhones, the quality is so good. So therefore you can just film yourself. Obviously, if you're doing majority of your stuff is gonna be based on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, use your, the you know, the long side of your phone. If you're gonna put it on things like YouTube, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, you wanna use your phone, um, you know, horizontally um, because just that's the way that the, the systems want you to do it. Um, for video editing itself, I use Filmora, um, really low cost editing suite, really, really good, like simple to use. You can do good overlays. You can put in uh, background information. Yeah, Filmora, uh, Wondershare by Filmora, it's called. Um, yeah, really nice and easy to use. Um, and obviously you can use Canva. Um, you know, it's really the, the stuff that they're doing with Canva at the moment is absolutely phenomenal. They've just brought out a background remover for videos in Canva. Um, they're just beta testing it at the moment. It's not brilliant, but it's getting there. They're using the same obviously software that they use for background remover for imagery. Um, so, you know, just if you've got software that you already use, like, you know, if, if I only had Canva, I could do all of this in Canva. I could overlay a picture of myself or a video of myself with a screen share. So, none of this has to be complicated or expensive it used to be but it doesn't have to be anymore um so you know 
don't don't get sort of too caught up in thinking well i haven't got this haven't got that if you've, you've only got canva just use canva because it'll do the job okay any other questions in the chat that i've missed it was other um sort of just people talking about other bits of software they use and um and people raving about loom as well <laughs> okay yeah no. um sarah i just i'd be really interested in a show of hands about how many people on this call are comfortable because there's 20 people how many people are comfortable showing up on video because i've coached people who are just absolutely terrified of being in front of a camera and speaking to a camera so it's a brilliant idea and i love doing it i do it once a week yeah. but i know that it's a huge barrier for some people so it's just lovely to get a show of hands mm -hmm. a thumbs up if Julia, so show of hands who's comfortable who's comfortable on camera two it's a half yeah yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a high pr proportion, do you think, Fiona, then for if you ask that in another group, would that be a similar number, do you think, or would that be slightly lower? That's a, that's a really good um, percentage. I'm impressed. I'm delighted because um, it's not my experience is it's people are quite low. And even someone I coached made a decision afterwards that it just wasn't it wasn't for her. So it's yeah. it's really interesting to hear this. I think the thing is with showing up on video, um, like I can honestly tell you, even when I had, like I, I never, apart from my really close family, um, I never, you never would have seen me without either a wig or a he he headscarf on when I was really poorly. I just didn't do the bald head, you know, like if someone wants to do that, that's totally up to them. It's just not me. The same as I wouldn't leave the house without makeup on. It's just my own personal thing. Um, but the days that I did have to show up on camera and do videos, yes, it takes a lot to go, do you know what? Oh, I've got to show up and I've got to do this. But most people, when they go to do video or they go to do live, I, I personally prefer a live experience for, so to create my videos live because I don't overthink it. Um, sometimes when people are recording themselves, they go, oh, I made a mistake, and they stop. And they spend so much time actually wasting time on going, I can't do this, I can't do this. If you push yourself into a live environment, even if you're talking to absolutely nobody, you are still broadcasting. And I also tell myself, the only person that is watching me is one person. There isn't this stadium of people on Facebook. They're all sitting there going, oh, yeah, God, look what she looked like. Oh, look at her hair. You know, they just start, they're just not doing that. It's one person watching their phone going, that's really interesting. Oh, yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah. And so whenever I talk to somebody, obviously I'm talking to a group of people now, but when you see me talk on Facebook or LinkedIn or any of my videos, I am talking to one person because there is only one person at a time watching me. So therefore, I look directly at the camera. I engage like I'd be looking into somebody's eyes and I will talk to them. So I don't say, you know, hi, guys, how are you all today? Because there'll be someone going, oh, someone, someone with me. You know, it's just a weird thing to do. But I think we forget that it's just one person. It's just one listener. So if you was just to talk to somebody and do a sales call, or if you was to talk to somebody when you bumped into them in, in Tesco's and you're talking about your business, that's just how I position it. I'm just talking to one person and it's not a group of people that can be going, oh, look at her, like, well, she, well, she thinks she knows it all or whatever. I just don't let that into my mind. I'm just talking to one person and I'm helping. And that's how I that's how I personally do it and have done for years. And also when you do it live, something in your brain just kicks in, doesn't it? Yeah. It's like the adrenaline or something. You've just got to keep going. And it's, yeah, yeah they are way easier than going, oh, no, that wasn't good enough. Oh, no, start again, start again. Uh, yeah. But Denise has a question. Yeah, so um, I wear quite a number of different hats. So in my project management role, this comes up quite often. So I have a background in marketing and the sales guy where I work at the moment has a real issue again. Well, I know I'm going to rephrase this question. I'm not going to tell you what the issue is because then I ask a leading question. Um, uh, yeah. What is your opinion on raw footage versus very nice glossy footage that makes a company look nice? 
I have okay. an opinion on this, but I'm really interested in actually the group and yours. Sure. So 10 years ago, if you was to do raw footage or documented, like documentation style footage, it would be massively frowned upon because it was like, it makes you look unprofessional. You know, you you haven't got a budget to do video, da, 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 da. So there is, there is a time for polished video. So if you're doing things like a course, if you are doing something that is going to be used again and again and again, um, whether you're doing a landing page on your website, whether it is a welcome video, whatever it is, in my opinion, that has to be done in a as professional way that you can afford. OK. However, if you can't afford it and you are black at, blocking out your background like I have here and you're talking to camera, the sound is good. The quality of the video is good. That is good enough. Now, when you come to document document style video, if that's polished, that will actually do you more harm than good because it's over edited. It's overdone. So things like stories, things like reels, if they're too done, if they're too um, edited and pulled together, it doesn't show that you're an authentic person because you've, you know, that's why lots of people don't like filters. You know, if I was to go onto Instagram every day and, and just have a different filter on and, and be hidden behind something, they go, we can't see the real you. What, you know, what, what are you hiding behind? So when you actually have, it's like anything in a marketing strategy, you've got to use the tools and the medium based on what the result you're trying to do. If you think about people that document their lives day in, day in, day out, whether it's on a reality TV show or whether it is on a, a stories based, real based platform like TikTok, as an example, it has to be just how it is because people want to see you in your authentic self. That is where you build trust. That's where you build credibility because you can't, you know, if you don't know your stuff, you can't do it. And so that's where people want to see. So there is a place for both and you have to use them accordingly. Does that help? Yes, thank you. I'm going to take that snapshot and put it on his desk. Yes, no worries. <laughs> Sometimes it's better to not come from a colleague. But yeah, I think. Thank you. That's all right. You're welcome. Can I, um, Sarah? Can I? Can I also suggest that it it's about sustainability as well? Because if if we hire a studio and do a few really nice flashy things and we attract a certain kind of client and then we can't sustain that level of judge and sophistication yeah. it, it falls flat completely yeah. and also I think we could put off a certain segment of our potential audience if we're so polished especially for what I do because it's a case of they think oh, I'll never be like that so <laughs> one of my goals is to make people feel that any of them can be effective and engaging because yep. the bar isn't isn't actually that high um so yeah that's one of my approaches would you I agree always, with that yeah absolutely and I always remind people like if you go if, just go on to tiktok you know set yourself a timer because you could end up down a you know rabbit warren but you need to make sure that when you go when you go on to something like tiktok and you see the highest trending videos, they are absolutely dire. Like they're, why would somebody watch it? So if people, millions of people are watching those videos, then whatever you're creating that is actually really good content is, is not as bad, nowhere near as bad as that. So you've got to think actually, if I just put my stuff out there, then it's gonna help somebody, then that's all I can, all I can ask for, okay? Okay, moving on to the next one, uh, and another one that people are often scared of because of the technology, and that is podcasts. Now, we know that if we create video and we can strip out the audio or we create podcasts and we then use that audio for creating blogs or outsourcing them to writers, etc. Podcasts are still the easiest way to create content from your phone with a simple app that sounds beautiful, that publishes it for you on all the platforms. 
and starts to build your credibility. If you as a business person have things like a website, a podcast, a book, a course, the credibility that goes with those things is enormous. Now, I'm not talking about saying, right, you've got, go and, you've got to go and do a book now, you've got to go and do a podcast. But think about how you can start pushing yourself out there in ways that you can build that credibility because it really, really is important. OK, uh, has anybody got a podcast? Show of hands. Does anybody want a podcast? Doesn't know how to do one. So got a podcast? Put your hands up, sorry. OK, only, only one or two. Wants a podcast? Okay, quite a few people. Couldn't think of anything worse to do than have a podcast. So, so, so not many people. OK, fine. Um, the, there's a brilliant piece of software out there. It's completely free. It's called Anchor. Uh, you create everything inside the software itself. It's on your phone um, using your you can talk directly into your phone or use AirPods or, a micro, you know, or your um, headphones is, is good enough quality because it sort of goes through a process of tidying it up a little bit. You connect up <coughs> me, Apple, Spotify um, to the software itself and it publishes it out there, starts building rankings. It is absolutely fabulous. You can do intros, you can do music jingles, all inside the app. Um, and it just positions yourself. You just need to make sure that if you do go down the route of having a podcast, that one, you do a couple of things. Um, you know when your consistency rates are. So if you say, well, actually, I can do a podcast once a month, just do a podcast once a month. If you do it fortnightly, weekly, however, but just be consistent about it because the system likes to see. And also people that follow you will be like, oh, a podcast comes out on Tuesday. And this is the key thing that we are all conditioned now to have stuff um, as and when we want it. But sometimes taking something away from somebody and saying, I'm going to do it on a Tuesday, then they look forward to that Tuesday. Um, so just making sure that you have consistency when you do your podcast. The second thing is to make sure that you have a call to action. A great way to do this is to offer show notes that they can download and digest. And then anything that you do, you talk about on your podcast, whether it's a worksheet or a downloadable, that there was always something that they can access on every single podcast is really, really important. It will massively grow your email list and then people get closer to be able to be converted uh, to you. And then obviously make sure that you let everybody know about what you do. But they're easy and they're straightforward. Julia. Yeah, so, right, so you can record a video. Um, can you then upload the particular file up to anchor so that anchor yeah. then you don't need to record directly into anchor no you don't if you're going to do it repurposing way then you just upload the mp mp3 yeah and then just top and tail it with your jingle or whatever and just say in this episode i'm going to be talking about xyz and then you go into the content if wow. you're doing if you're doing podcast um audio off the back of a live video you just need to make sure that you aren't talking about any like you know leave a comment below and all that sort of stuff if you're going to do that make sure you chop those bits out before because people just go well that's a bit weird so if you then say you do intro then you do content you might ask for engagement when you go to upload that just slice out that portion and then carry on it's quite it's straightforward it doesn't it's not complicated but just make sure you have a structure to your lives so therefore you can remove the interactive portions of that thank you okay. any other questions about podcasts no okay cool uh next thing i'm going to talk about is converting signatures now lots of people when they send out emails um, whether it's just a, an email to somebody that it's a personal email between you and a client or whether it is on a email blast, so whether you're sending out a newsletter, or more importantly, when you're sending out an email sequence off the back of an email sign up. So whether that is based off the back of a lead magnet or something that they've signed up for, it's important that you always give somebody the option to work with you. Okay, now 
you might think, well, that's straightforward, Sarah, like, don't be silly. But go back through the last couple of emails that you've received from people and they do one of two things. They either just constantly sell to you or they're content emails and you're left going, now what? Okay. We are conditioned as people to be sold to because everywhere we look, we're constantly being advertised to buy this, do this. Have you done this? You know, or, you know, loads and loads of stuff and even more now with social media. So the way in which we do this in a way that is really gentle and not force, you know, you're not forcing anyone to do anything in any way is that you give people the option that when they are ready, this is the ways you can work with me. OK, so it could be a really nice content driven email about something that you're talking about. And then you, you sign off and then you say, P.S. When you're ready, here are three ways you can work with me or here are four ways that you can work with me or here are two ways that you can work with me. And by doing that, you are just putting a line in the sand and saying, this is what I do. This is how I do it. And this is how you can be part of it if you want to. I'm not selling anything to you. I'm just letting it's just information. And the way this works is that the first option has to be free. So it could be a Facebook group, it could be a lead magnet that is not obviously attached to the one that you are currently doing. It could be an ebook that you have, something that is just here you go. I've got this thing. If you want it, you're welcome to have it. The next thing is the sort of the easiest way they can start working with you so this could be you know i do a free oh, sorry i do a low cost discovery call it's an hour blah, blah, blah. this is how you can do it and you just let people know what it is who you know who is it for and what they get from it and then a link to obviously to make the book in or whatever and then you work your way up to the most premium product that you have so most people would have their premium product is working with them directly one to one and that there are you know limited spaces on that because there's only so many hours in a day. So that would be your premium product. If you're really ready to get your marketing absolutely sorted, book a call and let's work together one to one. That would be my type of thing. Yeah. If next thing down, I have a group program that you can work, you go through my system the same way as you work in one to one. It's a lower cost because you're working with a group of people. Click here to find out all the details, etc. So having a converting signature, if you don't already have one, absolutely get it sorted out this afternoon because the amount of little work that you will pick up from that just by them going, oh, I didn't know you did that. Even though you talk about it every day on social media, they're like, oh, I didn't know you did that. Or, oh, that, oh that's what you do. It's just putting that out there in black and white this is what I do. This is how I do it. OK, any questions about that? Julia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just like <laughs> asking lots of questions. So exactly. are you are you like actually putting that into an actual signature or is that like the call to action before you say with best wishes, Julia, or is that like underneath Julia, Blake Consultants, and then this is the way we can work together? I mean, is, how, what's best? Is it? you know is it like above where you sign no, your name no, it's like no. right at the bottom so oh. yeah it's your name sign off as usual and it's just like a ps it's the ps Brilliant. yeah yeah cool thank you all right cool that's so Vera, oh, can sorry. i just observe that sounds a little bit like colombo or vera where they're about to leave and they turn around and the most important thing they say in the whole conversation is that last little bit that yeah, just yeah. Gets, gets you where you need to go. Yeah, so it sounds like a Colombo move to me. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. The final one before we move on to the, the, the extra conversation bit is um, UGC. Now, you may, he may hear this around. It's user-generated content. Now, your customers will sell your product and service better than you ever can because the prospects that you work with don't feel like they're being sold to because you're not doing it. So therefore, where possible, if you have got a screen, a screen grab of comments that people have made or they're physically going onto 
social media and sharing your stuff, um, grab as much of that stuff as possible and reshare it again and again and again, because that is going to absolutely soar your leads into your business tenfold because they, it's not like you saying, well, I work with these clients and these are the results I get. This is your client saying, oh my God, I've just got this result because of the work we did together. And they go, oh, I need those results as well. And so they see something in the person that you work with and go, well, I'm just like them. So therefore, if she, if they can help that person, then she can help me as well. And so where possible, try and integrate as much user generated content into your day to day marketing as possible, um, because it will dramatically change. OK, you have to be consistent with it. You have to you know, it's not going to instantly you're not going to get you know, you're not going to post one thing and instantly you're going to get thousands of people come to you. It's again, just building that trust credibility and um, people will go, oh, I need to work with that person because I like what they do and I'm just like that person and I want more of that as well. OK, who by show of hands is already using a uh, user generated content? One, two. So, yes, yeah, some of some of you are, some of you aren't. OK, has anybody got any issue with asking for user generated content or is feeling a bit stuck of actually how that happens? No. Oh. Do you want to unmute? Do you want to tell me where you might be stuck? Um, it's just um, it's, it's knowing how to ask people okay. um, the right way without feeling sort of, you know, <laughs> needy. <laughs> so. yes. Do you often get text messages or emails from clients that say, oh, I've, I've just got this result or I've just done this and oh, my God, it was amazing. Or if, are you getting regular feedback but they usually company. they usually say it when they're with me. Okay. Um, I mean, odd times emails, but no, I was just thinking I don't ask them for I should ask for reviews and things like that. But I'm always a bit cagey about I don't know, invading what, their space. What do you, what do, you do? Um, I hypnotherapy and also okay. I do learning developmental stuff for children. Okay, perfect. So the the results that you'll be getting for your clients will be will be constant. So whether it is, you know, whether you're with somebody and they say, oh, I just did that and say, could you do me a favor? Could you just drop back to me in a text? I won't share your name, but I really want to work with more people just like you that are getting these results. Yeah. And so they go, oh, yeah, that's fine. As long as you don't use my name, I'm happy about that. Um, if they're doing something and they've got they've really hit a, you know, a milestone and they're posting on their own social media and they say, you know, oh, you know, I've just say, for instance, they're, I don't know, um, they've got a fear of flying and they've just taken the most amazing trip to Australia and they post out a whole load of things. And you can say, would you mind if I use that on my social media? Because more people need to be able to do what you do. And so, so do you, I mean, I don't normally follow my people on Instagram. I don't tend to follow what they're doing. And OK, so um, if it's a big thing, so to be doing. an example of some a result that you've got from from one of your clients. Um, just as yesterday, um, guy who had massive anxiety, um, no confidence at all. And now he's just really loving life. Yeah. And what what's as a result of that, what's happening for him? Um, he's progressing in his work more. Uh, mm -hmm. His relationship is better. Yeah. And he's just not he was shaking when he arrived first of all with me he's not he's just really confident now yeah so that is a really great way of saying you know like you know I love the change in you and would you mind just dropping me a quick message about what yeah. what the work we've done together really means for you because just need to get sure on it, like, <laughs> and just sort of, I, it, sometimes the first time you ask for it it feels a bit icky yeah but what you're saying is I just want to help more people like you yeah, and that's, that's the key thing and it just feels right to do that and then if somebody sends you a text message or an email just instantly reply back to them and say can I screen grab this and use this on Facebook I won't use your name I'll completely you know get rid of your name but this is really good stuff and you know I know it's going to help more people just get into the habit of doing it on a regular basis because it will honestly change the way your leads come in you don't retype it. You literally just take a picture of it 
and remove their name and post okay. it out as, as yeah. sort of, you know in an ugly fashion if you want to I know that um Emma you recently just did a like a screen share of about five or six didn't you of um things that people have said to you recently and you know so stuff like that if you know feel if it feels a bit icky just doing one say like this is this month's feedback from my clients like I'm blown away you know this is I'm so proud of the work we've done together and it can just be as, as simple as that it doesn't have to be you know you don't have to write a really long post and say you know if you want if you want to feel like this too then contact me the the it's it, it's own work for you you know yeah fantastic thank you cool any other oh Julia yeah Bella had a, her hand up but then it went down so I don't know <laughs> It was more just, uh, um, I think you covered most of the points that um, I was actually going to say, but it was more so, I work with a lot of people that don't ask for testimonials um, and help understand like how powerful they are for your client experience. Um, so if you do have any questions, like don't hesitate to reach out. I've got some time and I'm more than happy to walk through any other questions that you might have around how you can ask for testimonials if someone says no, what to do if they don't get back to you and things like that. So yeah, feel free to reach out at any time and yeah, that's um, great. Covered a lot and, of points around what I was saying around keeping it natural. Yes, absolutely. And it's the same when it comes to referrals. You know, lots of people get really nervous about asking for referrals, but the actual process itself is the same. If you've got results for somebody and well, one, they'll sing for you anyway, regardless whether you ask them to or not, because they're so happy. Some people, if it is private, they might not want to admit that they're getting help. And that's also fine. Um, so you can, you know, build case studies, you know, et cetera, like, you know, um, like Bella said. So, you know, just make sure you're building that into your marketing strategy as well. OK. If you aren't following your clients on social um, because it's a private thing, that's fine make sure you're following them on a platform so whether it's instagram or whether it's tiktok or something so you can sort of see what they're doing because often i will see clients do something and just message them and say that was brilliant that's such a brilliant post or god you should be really proud of yourself or you know just that gentle reinforcement is goes the extra mile and it really does make a difference um, and also you can see the results they're getting from the work that you're doing. So, you know, I totally get you might want to be might not want to be friends with them on Facebook, but make sure that you are on one of the platforms having some interaction with them. OK. And then the final one that I wanted to talk about is the the takeover of Twitter. Um, if you haven't already heard, Elon Musk has bought Twitter for 44 billion dollars you know small change to most of us i know but um the you know interesting process he's going through he has just recently sacked um all the major senior team within twitter and is now going through the company and sacking them in the most disgusting way i've ever seen hr people if you're not if you, anyone here in hr i don't know sorry but if you are if you're not jumping on the back of Elon Musk's activities, it's content, absolute content gold at the moment, uh, sending gifts to his, as in video gifts to his staff saying, time for you to leave the nest, you're sacked, is absolutely horrendous. Um, however, it will be very interesting to see how Twitter changes. There are lots of people leaving Twitter very quickly and cutting off their advert spend. Um, but he is going to be bringing in a paid access platform. Um, they think it's going to be about $8 a month to join. You won't have ads and you'll automatically get a blue tick to say that your account is fully verified, which to me goes against the whole blue tick stuff in the first place. But however, uh, it'll be interesting to see. Now, when new platforms are created, this early adopter, uh, you know, feel um, you might see it with some of the other platforms that are, um, you know, sort of starting at the moment. And you ask yourself whether or not you, you should be an early adopter or whether you should just, ha you know, hang back and see what happens. Now, Twitter is a funny one because it's going to go through like a rebirth a little bit 
So you'll get that early adopter phase, um, but on a very well established platform. He has got obviously a huge amount of money to be able to invest and change things quite dramatically when it comes to Twitter. So you've got to ask yourself a question. Do I want to make sure that I'm positioned in Twitter in such a way that when whatever's coming, I'm going to get some, you know, some growth from this? Um, my take on this is that if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter and while well, it's still free. If you haven't updated your profile in like forever, update your profile, making sure that all of your links, etc., are active and that your domain and everything's nice and tidy. Your profile's there, you know, that you say who you are um, and that like anything else that you're just showing up every now and again. There are lots of interesting stuff, com stuff coming um, on Twitter in terms of uh, chat groups. They're obviously already doing a, um, a you know, an audio based uh, offering there as well. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how Twitter develops. But, you know, if you don't do anything else, then just make sure your profile's up to date because there's going to be lots of traffic dri driving to Twitter because people are going to want to see what it's about. Um, so therefore, if you're there and you're a little bit active, then you're more than likely going to be picking stuff up. Uh, it's more about creating content on Twitter than it is about having its, you know, your own independent content um, because it is more, you know, it's micro blogging. So it's your opinions on stuff. It's your take on something that drives people to your website, etc. But I know a lot of people that do a lot of micro blogging on Twitter and drive huge amounts of traffic to the website for them to then convert. So as Julia said, it, you know, who by show of hands is on Twitter so about about half who is active on twitter a couple yeah so it'll be interesting to see has anybody got any opinions or any thoughts about how twitter is going to be developing or whether or not they're going to be just not bothering when it comes to twitter i got grave reservations about being on it and being seen to support that man i'm sorry it's as simple yeah. as that um yeah. and i yeah i've got an hr background um there's a, an nlp presupposition um there's a positive intention behind all human behavior i'm really curious about what his personal positive intention is um there will be something i just cannot see it it'll it'll be something of self interest i'm sure because that's the sort of person that he seems to be from the behavior that he displays um and i'm not sure i really want to be associated with that kind of person again i don't know that it sits well with my ethics it, i'm not sure yeah. it sits well with my how, how can you say it right so i i like to think of myself as an e uh, egalitarian you know everybody is equal and and ex except when it comes to bigots in which case i'm absolutely bigoted about bigots yeah, um, yeah. You know, there's a there's a there's a dichotomy there, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think it will be. I think it will be a. You know, how much are you bothered by? You know, by this. Um, mm. You know, I'm. I I just don't like. I don't like bad treatment of anybody. And I, you know, I watched this guy's twist. This guy's TikTok about him just finding out he got sacked, and he just was like. I've worked there for 25 years like what do I like what do I do now like and I'm sure you'll get snapped up but it's just the way in which you just think you know you know I'm sure he's gonna have lawsuits left right and center isn't he but... it's the lack of humanity actually yeah. for me it's the lack of treating people like people and yeah. respecting that they have lives and they have other things going on for them it's just yeah. why would you do that I just I can't get my head around it it just you know it's just awful yeah so it will be interesting. Any, anyone else got any thoughts on it? I was going to say something similar. I mean, I'm assuming he's getting away with it because it's an American company and they don't really do workers' rights. So I don't really know how these people seem to get away with these no. things when, you you know. Um, I, I The problem is, I think, um, it, it, this is the problem with social media companies that across, I've just seen a headline come up that Meta and have said they're going to get rid of, is it 11,000? 11, 11,000. 11, 11, 
yeah so, so you know that they're, they're faceless though aren't they it's um the problem is the users are so far removed from the people behind the scenes because to them yeah, it's a yeah. channel it's a platform all they see is what's on their phone or whatever so i think um you know unfortunately or fortunately he will survive it will survive um but yeah i think all of us need to be mindful of this like you said about the blue tick sarah you know the, any anyone that can pay for something that proves they are i mean yeah. it's corruption right there so I think for me, that's the thing. I'm kind of, I suppose, personally, I'm lucky because I'm hiding behind or or committed to whichever way you want to see it, doing one social channel well. And that for me is LinkedIn. That's where I'm getting my leads yeah. from. And, and I'm better on the long form stuff. And I don't have the time. I think with Twitter to do it justice, you've got to be on it a lot, haven't you? So yeah, I'm yeah. sort of, that's protecting me from having to make a decision at the moment. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know it's really hard he's a very very strange guy so it goes so far on Julie's point to say he's, he's probably a bit of a sociopath isn't he so um or psychopath or whatever you call it so I don't know that you can even judge him by normal standards but yeah it's an interesting one yeah so that is pretty much that I hope that's been super helpful and Julie I'm, I'm absolutely open to questions if that's okay Yes, wonderful. So the meeting uh, sort of officially finishes at, at 12.15. We do find some people leave at 12 because they have another course going to, but we are all here till 12.15 or whoever wants to be. Um, so yeah, so let's open the floor to some questions because thank you, Sarah. You've just given us so, so much. Absolutely brilliant. Really round of applause to, to Sarah. But I mean, I've written pages of notes yet again. But thank you again, Sarah Sangster. Great. And lovely to thank see you. everybody. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.